en este gran homenaje que le estamos haciendo a nuestra amiga Eugenia Correa y vamos a la conferencia de Luis Philippe Rochon, que es Monetary Policy y es a critique in three acts. Ok, Luis Philippe, the microphone. It's, it's, you are on the floor. Your microphone, Luis Philippe. Okay. Buenos días, buenas tardes y buenas noches. Gracias por esta invitación. Ofrezco mi más sentido, uh, sentido pesarme a Gregorio y a toda la familia Correa Vidal. Perdimos, perdimos a un gran economista, amigo, mentor y ser humano. While my Spanish may not be excellent, I wanted to say something in Spanish. honor uh, uh, Eugenia. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. I apologize. Okay, um, the talk today, the title is a little bit different. Um, the inherent uh, inherent biases of monetary policy and its interview to our good friend. I want to say that um, um, I keep very good memories of Joania, whether it was uh, Paris or Mexico City or in Buenos Aires various cities in the United States, in, in Montreal, which I think is the last time I might have seen her. Um, we hope that um, she's in a better place. And I'm in particular uh, aware that she was supposed to chair this session this morning. Uh, so my thoughts go to uh, Alicia as well, her, her, her friend, her comrade, and uh, thank you. Okay, so oh, I got through that. Um, I like to start always with this quote by Keynes. I think it's an appropriate quote. It was written almost a hundred years ago, but it's one that is just as relevant today as it was written back then. I want to say that um, the talk today is not as much a paper as it is um, a summary, a presentation of a research project um, that I'm going to begin uh, on in July. Um, we are getting funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, a rather large amount over three years, which will allow us to hire uh, postdocs. Um, and so this um, And so this research project is really sort of the, the, the result of a number of years of, of thinking about monetary policy and central banking and very much influenced, uh, and you'll see this immediately by, uh, and, and not surprisingly, by the work of Marc Lavoie and, and Mario Sicherecchia. And, um, and you'll see how, and, 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 and it will become clear. And so what this um, project uh, is, is, is on various aspects of central banking and monetary policy. And I make a difference uh, between monetary policy, which would be interest rate, the implementation of, of, of monetary policy and central banking, which would be sort of the institutional uh, uh, um, part of how our central banks um, uh, you know, the independence of central bank, how are they structured, et cetera. And this is becoming an interesting conversation amongst heterodox economists 
about um, the inner workings of, 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 of central banks. And so, as you may know, uh, this is the audience I don't have to convince, but post Keynesians have a very different view of how monetary policy works, how it's implemented. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about this. Um, and I want to begin with, you know, Mishkin's paper from 2007, where he lists the nine principles of monetary policy before the financial crisis of 2007, eight. And, you know, nothing in here is surprising to us, to this audience. Um, you know, these are all things that we've come to expect of the mainstream. Um, you know, sort of inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Price stability has important benefits. Um, and, um, and you can read through this. And like I said, nothing sort of is surprising, but what is surprising is uh, Michigan's conclusion where he says, you know, financial crisis or not, nothing has changed in terms of the science of monetary policy. These nine elements are still relevant for monetary policy and they're still standing. Uh, and I'm not sure what Michigan would have said uh, post COVID, but I'm assuming he would have said something quite similar. The only thing that he has called for, which is slightly different, is a flexible inflation targeting um, policy, which is close to what the Fed or very similar to what the Fed is now um, advocating for a flexible form of average inflation targeting. So the idea that, you know, the model is still the same, we, not, we might not be uh, as quick on the trigger to raise interest rates if inflation starts um, increasing. So, um, you know, and, and such models um, are all about stability and convergence to natural values, right? This is sort of a very standard neoclassical model. Um, and it applies to monetary policy where it's about convergence to the natural rate of what, what I call, you know, the natural rate of inflation, which is the chosen target of, let's say, 2%, convergence to the natural rate of interest, convergence to the natural output. Um, and it excludes also the possibility that monetary policy may have any sort of permanent effect on the real economy, right? So this is a very definition of the long run neutrality of money and of monetary policy. Um, But for some post-Keynesians, um, myself included, and not all post-Keynesians will agree with this approach, uh, monetary policy is largely ineffective, even at, especially, I should say, at the lower bound. Uh, you can't force a horse to drink. And this is not because of the liquidity trap, um, but simply because uh, maybe consumption and investment don't uh, respond as, um, clearly to changes in the, or incremental changes in the rate of interest, which is highlighted in work by Fazari, for example, Setterfield and others. Uh, there's talk about uh, asymmetric impact of monetary policy. Um, maybe zero bound policies may not work, but uh, maybe incremental changes in interest rates may not work, but you know, 10, 12 incremental increases might actually eventually uh, collapse the economy. And, um, and so for that reason, some post Keynesians, what I have called the revolutionary endogenous in my book, uh, are pro you know, probably advocate more for fiscal policy dominance uh, rather than monetary policy dominance, which was the case uh, before uh, you know, before COVID or before the crisis. And of course, the question is, when will this change uh, again back to monetary policy and dominance? So as I said, uh, the post Keynesian position is very different. Um, I have uh, sort of divided the post Keynesians between what I call the activists and the parking it rules. Uh, Lavoie has called them the, uh, the uh, 
uh, income distributive post Keynesian, something like that. And uh, but uh, essentially, the post Keynesians are divided between those who advocate for fine tuning and not fine tuning. And the question is, you know, is fine tuning effective? Um, for me, uh, those who advocate for fine tuning uh, sort of uh, um, have very similar uh, sort of objectives or views or vision of the transmission mechanisms. Um, but rather than having an inflation target, they propose uh, an output target of growth or an unemployment target, or maybe a capacity utilization target. Um, and so for me, uh, this doesn't do, um, doesn't change things much. It's still a belief that monetary policy can be used through fine tuning uh, to achieve some sort of real or nominal target. And so for me, I always have this quote by, by Mark uh, in uh, the book, Money in Motion. And uh, it's sort of my go-to quote um, all the time. Um, and then Lavoie and Sekereccia in a 1999 paper um, have said very similar things. Perhaps I should have put that quote up as well. But, um, you know, for, for us, uh, fine tuning is ineffective. And, you know, this is not a question of just horizontalists and structuralists. You know, Randy Ray is of this opinion uh, as well. Basil Moore was a fine tunist, if that word exists. So uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't cut through the traditional horizontalist structuralist, but rather it's a view on what the rate of interest is and what it does and, and, and all of that. And then, you know, even before Lavoie, there was this uh, very nice quote by Chris Snigel um, in the, oh, I think it's Journal of Economic Issues, where Chris really sort of summarizes very well uh, sort of the income distributive channels of monetary policy. And I've lectured on this before, and this is uh, not as much the, the, the view or the objective of this presentation to go into details about this, but, um, but and, and of course it goes back to Keynes and the euthanasia of the Keynes. So there's an old tradition about, uh, about this approach. But what I do wanna talk about today is um, sort of uh, this view um, about monetary policy that I don't think has been uh, presented in this way before. And this is sort of the basis of this research project uh, that I'm undertaking with um, Silvio Capes in Brazil, Guillaume Vallée in France, Melanie Long in the United States. And, um, and I want to, so for me, as I explained, there are sort of this income distributive uh, implications to monetary policy. And it raises the question of whether monetary policy has any inherent biases. So the first is whether monetary policy is class biased. Now, Mario has alluded to this very nicely when he has argued that monetary policy is perhaps best seen as an incomes policy. And, and and I'll explain that in a few minutes. And also whether monetary policy is gender biased, whether changes in the rate of interest disproportionately affect gender. And we can also add to that racialized minorities. And finally, um, is monetary policy carbon biased? And so by seeing, um, monetary policy in terms of, of biases sort of changes the focus, uh, changes the importance, changes perhaps the objective of what monetary policy should and shouldn't do. Um, and so, like I said, I think it's the first time that this is framed in terms of three over, uh, overreaching biases. And maybe by thinking a little bit, we can maybe add a few more. 
but um, but this research project will focus on on these biases. And so um, these biases will also be part of a book series uh, that I'm uh, leading uh, for Elgar. Um, and uh, this, these, this is a series of 10 books. And then all the books will have a very, uh, and, and some of you have chapters in some of the books. And the books will be something like central banking, monetary policy, and gender, central banking, monetary policy, and climate change, central banking, monetary policy, and income distribution, central banking and monetary policy, and, right? So um, all of these 10 books will sort of be um, a very sort of, uh, I think, I hope, an important contribution to the post-Keynesian approach to, to central banking and monetary policy. In addition, of course, to everything else that's been written on it. So the first is whether monetary policy is class biased. And this is a, a figure uh, that appears uh, in a uh, chapter that Mario and I wrote. Uh, I'm not sure if it's coming out, that's another story. But um, so where we, here we develop sort of um, different channels in terms of income and wealth uh, channels, if you want, and uh, what we've also called direct and indirect mechanisms. So changes in the rate of interest um, through the income channel um, will lead to um, changes in the rate of interest on bonds, uh, rentier income, right? So as the interest rate goes up, uh, the rentier income goes up, what John Smith and is called the revenge of the rentier. And there'll be an indirect mechanism through the influence of labor markets, its impact on unemployment, wages, income, uh, income shares, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and so in that way, uh, monetary policy may um, have negative impacts on uh, the working class, for example, uh, and may benefit rents here. And of course you have to take the net effects because they'll also be, so as the interest rate goes down, for example, uh, that might lead to uh, lower interest rates on bonds. So uh, sort of the, the euthanasia of the rent here income, precisely what Keynes was talking about. And that might have a positive effect on labor market. Um, but again, we'd have to take the net effects uh, of that all. And um, regarding the direct mechanism, Marc and Mario has developed the Pazinetti index and the modified Pazinetti index to measure that component uh, specifically. And also uh, changes in monetary policy may have wealth effects. I mean, may have, do, does have, and may lead to uh, asset inflation and et cetera. And so this is, uh, and of course, you know, who owns, who tends to own these, uh, these assets uh, is a class uh, question. And so is the interest rate really uh, at the center of a class conflict? So does monetary policy contribute to income and wealth inequality? And more specifically, are these effects short or long lived? Now, uh, the, you know, just, to, you know, discussing monetary policy and an income inequality was a no no before the financial crisis. You know, the mainstream just didn't, uh, didn't accept it. I applied, uh, I applied 20 years ago when I was still at Callum's New College for, uh, a grant from the institute that's funding this precise uh, project now. And um, they turned me down at that time. And one of the refere referees was saying, you know, first of all, income inequality is not something to be discussed in economics. And second, certainly there's no relation between monetary policy and income inequality. So to say that the world has changed, has evolved a lot since then, 
But even then, it really took sort of the, the, the financial crisis to really bring uh, the idea to, um, to a greater audience and certainly more acceptable uh, uh, by uh, the mainstream. And there's, I want to uh, talk about this. I just want to mention this book by Dietz Fontaine and Claveau called Do Central Banks Serve the People, which is a fantastic uh, book. Dietz is Canadian. Fontaine Claveau uh, uh, are French, I think. And so um, the mainstream today doesn't really uh, question uh, the income distributive uh, properties of monetary policy. Curie, who was the number two at uh, the Federal Reserve, um, you know, certainly accepts that now. And um, also QE um, about wealth effects. So again, nothing too surprising here for post Keynesians. Uh, we've been arguing that for quite a while. But the difference between the post-Keynesians and the mainstream is whether these effects are long-lasting. So, of course, for the mainstream, they cannot be long-lasting. Because if they are, that means you're accepting that monetary policy is not neutral in the long run. So they have to be short-lived. And they have to be sort of ambiguous or the side effect of pursuing uh, inflation targeting or uh, transitory. And because they lead, they, they, they conclude this, well, quite naturally, um, yeah, so they're unintended uh, uh, results. And because they do, then income inequality can be ignored from the perspective of, uh, of central bank policy. And so the challenge here for the post Keynesians is to show that uh, changes in monetary policy can have long lasting effects. And what are these effects and how do these effects manifest themselves, right? Structural changes in the way the economy operates. And so this is the challenge for post Keynesians with that, um, with that, uh, uh, with that uh, approach, right? Um, well, the second uh, bias is whether monetary policy is gender biased. Um, and so there's a growing body of work amongst the feminists and the stratification economists that argue precisely that uh, changes of mon in monetary policy disproportionately uh, uh, affect uh, uh, or favor white men or affect negatively women. Uh, our friend Alyssa Brownstein, Stephanie Seguino, they have written uh, on this. Uh, Seguino and Hines has written on this precisely. And they have actually looked more also at racialized uh, uh, minorities, especially black men, black women. And there's also sort of this research being done on the asymmetrical distributional gender impact of quantitative easing, for example. Um, a great paper here, a really recent paper um, by Young. And um, I also want to mention uh, the work of um, Rem in, uh, in, in, in Vienna, who does this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, research. And so this is a, a quote by Elissa and James, after controlling for long-term employment trends, right? This would be the, what we call the indirect channel. We find that the ratio of women's to men's employment tends to decline during these periods in the majority of countries examined. So, um, so this we will study uh, more, uh, more in depth over the three years of the program which will be the, the, the second year specifically of the research project. And um, we're looking to, to generate a number of research papers on this. Um, and so like I mentioned, Miriam's a research where she looks at QE, but also monetary policy on wealth inequality, on bubbles, uh, asset inflation, et cetera. So this is, you know, and I spent quite a long time sort of Googling 
uh, looking up whether there's some stuff in the mainstream about this. And there are a few papers, but certainly uh, not very much. So this is an area that is not very um, developed in, uh, in the mainstream. And I'm currently talking to the OECD about doing some sort of conference workshop on this topic. I think it would be an excellent topic um, to discuss uh, and bringing in a more, a more mainstream audience to, to discuss. Whether they're interested in discussing is a different issue. And um, again, so I mentioned the Brigitte Young, uh, Brigitte Young paper, which is a, a, a very good. And then the final uh, component uh, of this project it would be to examine whether monetary policy is carbon biased. Now I want to say, of course, that part of what we want to do is bring you know, policy suggestions to combat um, these biases. And in this area, um, we want to look at whether um, uh, changes in uh, interest rates encourage uh, carbon intensive industries to invest or not. And um, there is not a lot of research on this topic. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to, to sort of in the third year of the project to look at this more closely. And of course, uh, there is a lot of research from a post Keynesian perspective. And here I, I, I call uh, attention specifically to uh, Nicolaidi and Galana's paper in ecological economics, where they talk about, um, you know, green monetary policy. So how can we green interest rates? And um, and in fact, uh, in the post-Keynesian uh, literature, there is uh, some literature on a green QE, which I'm sure many of you have uh, have have come across, and also green interest rates, or what's also called emission-based interest rates. And I'm not fully convinced uh, of this last component, but certainly worth exploring. And, uh, and developing further. And then in conclusion, because um, I think I had 30 minutes to, to talk and I was talking fast, but the, in conclusion, um, this is one book that also we're gonna be coming out with amongst that 10 book series, Central Banking, Monetary Policy and Democracy. And I have a forthcoming paper in PSL quarterly review on this. And it really is about uh, whether if we find empirical evidence, and I think we will, and there is already, about these biases, right? Class bias, gender bias, carbon bias. Then that question, uh, and if these biases are long lasting, and it leads to some sort of structural change. It leads to fundamental questions about the relationship between an institution, an independence in institution, and its policies affecting the economy in a democratic country, in a democratic state. And so the book is, is going to be central banking, monetary policy, and democracy. And it leads to the question of whether central banks are uh, democratically challenged. And, um, and one of the first papers that I've seen in my research so far on this is a paper by Stiglitz back in 1999, where he was talking about this, about social responsibility. And there are quite a few papers in sociology on this, uh, but not as much in economics, although it's starting to come out. And um, here, um, uh, Charles Goodart is one of the papers uh, that I'm publishing, and Etienne Farvac, who's done a lot of work on this as well. Um, and, and that certainly opens up the discussion about central bank independence and a lot more. You know, how, how should we uh, reform central banks in a way that diminishes these biases? 
Uh, and then this, it's a whole discussion that we can have uh, around that. And I think it's, I think I'm done. Oh, um, yeah, so uh, um, it goes exactly back to Mario's work on incomes policy and if central, if monetary policy is an incomes policy that over the last 40 years or so, excluding, you know, recent crises, that has benefited one social class over another, um, then this is a bias. And and we, what can we do about it? Okay, I think that's it. This is a Joyeux la Révolution. I thought it's a graffiti I saw, and I thought it was appropriate to end there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Philippe, and Viva la Revolución, as Alan Parguez always as Alan says all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Alan Parguez is always saying that. <laughs> well, Ms. Philippe, I, I will, um, it, it has been very interesting, the, um, your conference, and I want to point one thing that uh, I'm very happy that you include uh, gender in monetary policy because, <clears throat> as we have seen, there's a paper of Diane Elson, who talks about, uh, he, he wrote that paper after the Asian financial crisis. <clears throat> and he, and she- uh, What's your last name, Elson? How do you spell Elson? Diane Elson, Diane Elson, E-L-S-O-N. She's okay. emeritus from, I think it's Sussex, or I don't know, but she's uh, an emeritus. She's very close for, uh, with us and the Puea, make a conference just two or three weeks ago about social reproduction. And I will send you the conference. It is in the webpage of the University of Social, University Studies Program of Asian and Africa. But uh, I, will, I, I will point this because, um, well, Diane talks about the relation between the macro and the micro and especially how the, mac uh, the, the, the macro, especially after when the Asian crisis has in the, in the 90s, in, in, the, in, in the second half of the decade of the 90s, cross uh, many countries and, and the impact that has in gender. Because macro, of course, has immediately an impact in the microeconomic level. But that, what you can do with mesoeconomic, when she talks about mesoeconomic, there's the monetary and the fiscal and the financial policies. So this is very important because if you really want to change and every day, I think that uh, the gender policies are very important is because you, it is, you have to differentiate the policies between men and women and between children, even since the school. And especially in, in our the, the, uh, underdeveloped countries, it is very important to have these budgets if we the, the differentiation. And the thing that I want to put, because when you have these all these austerity programs, one of the the, the impact uh, is terrible in the in the gender. I was seeing a conference that a clerk, Alicia Barcenas gave. At, it was you know, on February. I don't remember also the date, but, but you can find in the uh, in the ICLAC web. Uh, it's about gender, and when they decide how how this the pandemic has impact, that sixty five percent of women are in a high risk level. Mm. More than men, it's like thirty five percent, because uh, uh, most of the women. Yeah are in the informality, yeah. most of them take care. And that's why one of the, um, how to say, the, the approach or the, um, let me see, I, I, I want to think that the word, una de las aportaciones of feminist economies is care economy. And care economy is not only taking care of the children or of your parents, no, take a core economy we must uh, diversify the concept because it is education, but it also is health. And it is, and also is um, environment. So in that way, monetary policy can, uh, can help you 
to improve and to trigger about uh, later uh, after the pandemic uh, uh, after the pandemic well we hope one day we we get out of this one of this um, problem but i think monetary policy has not only a class and a gender view but also a racial a, a racial view yeah no? yeah so yeah. I, I think that that's why well i'm very happy that you put in the monetary policy all this we had worked, Virginia has worked a lot. Uh, we have worked a lot the, the relation with between monetary policy and, and gender. And you can see with ex a lot of examples in the rural area. And also uh, the concept of social reproduction. I think that the concept of social reproduction, it is very, it, it is very important. Even it is a concept, a Marxist concept that it is in the social reproduction uh, Marx has two chapters in the first volume and in the in the um, and in the second volume. But in the first volume, he defines social reproduction because it is not only biological that it's well men women at least we are we can have the babies. I don't know maybe in in few years a robot can have babies, but also is the reproduction of the labor force. And in the other, just in a very, very, if you read very carefully that the definition that Marx uh, uh, wrote there in this chapter, it's social reproduction is that the reproduction of a social system. And in the reproduction of the social system, you have culture, you have class, you have income, racial problems. So, well, that will be my comment. And I give the floor if someone can participate. Yeah, let me just uh, say about the project, it has Melanie Long in it, and she did her PhD, I think, in Colorado, and someone that uh, I'm sure Gary Dimsky knows and a few others, uh, Hannah Zimborska. So she has done work on this as well, and we'll be calling on other people, and we'll be having three workshops over the next three, four years on these topics, and I'll be in touch with you, Alicia, absolutely about this, I just want to answer, um, there's a question here by Gary um, about MMT, where does it fit? And just a provocation, <laughs> uh, yeah, a, pro a very provocative uh, question. But you know, I've come a long way on MMT uh, from having been, I would say, rather hostile to rather, sympathetic to what they say. And I think that uh, for many reasons, first of all, it serves no one by uh, shooting ourselves in the feet, in, in the foot. Uh, second of all, uh, they're doing incredibly well. Why would we sabotage their attempts? You know, Tom Pally criticizes MMT and says 95% is just PK and 5% is, is, is original and wrong. Well, you know, if 95% of it is PK, why are we criticizing them so much publicly? So let's give them all the room to, 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 to do. And I think that they share a lot of the same ideas. And I think that uh, I've spoken to Stephanie about some of these biases uh, informally on Twitter and stuff and conflict and et cetera. She, she doesn't, she doesn't uh, disagree at all. Um, um, Lester has... Uh, a question, uh, where, how do these biases fit in with fine tuning and parking and approaches? Um, so first of all, the fine tuning issue, I've often wondered why some post Keynesians are so uh, attached to the idea of fine tuning, uh, despite what I would consider some empirical evidence showing that it's, it's, it, it doesn't work. Um, and speaking of MMT, for example, Randy and, and the MMT crowd is, of course, is very um, aware. I've made this argument before. I think that the reason some post Keynesians um, attach themselves who defend fine tuning is because ledge me making argument. I think that we are sort of uh, attached to the idea of having our institutions being very activist and interventionist. We believe in interventionist fiscal policy. 
Uh, and so maybe some of us believe that central banks should also be interventionist and, you know, uh, but I think that uh, it does more harm than good. So I think that the best approach, and I've, I've argued this before in a series of papers with, with Mark Sitterfield about a parking approach. And I, you know, I think that if in fact, um, we can show that there are some biases in fine tuning, it's just an example even further to say, you know, let's not fine tune, let's just park that interest rate and try to find an interest rate that is accommodated from uh, an income distribution perspective and no, let's rely on fiscal policy. So let's move the debate towards fiscal policy dominance and as good old Keynesians should do anyways. So in, in a way, it's ironic that I'm such a critical, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a monetary economist who's very critical of monetary economics. Um, Mario ha wants to ask a question. Mario, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Alicia. Um, excuse me. I, uh, I, I was, you know, you had uh, Louis Philippe. You, you, pro you provided for us a list of those three biases. Uh, uh, you know that uh, you know the first one being the on the class uh, issue. Uh, the second one uh, about uh, the you know uh, gender issue, and the third one uh, about uh, you know let's call it ecological or you know environmental or whatever you know uh, concerns. And uh, what I find interesting, in fact, just this morning, uh, listening to CBC, maybe you heard him too there. Uh, our former governor of the Bank of Canada, who also is former governor of the Bank of England right now, he's been saying this for a long time, uh, how to introduce, you know, the whole issue of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the environment, you know, the whole question of uh, in the ecological question here within the sort of framework of monetary policy. And uh, which is obvious because, of course, if you're a bank and you're going to be funding, <laughs> you're going to lending out, that ultimately could be, you know, lead to insolvency because of the catastrophic effect of these activities okay, over time. Uh, clearly, these are concerns that you know seem rather obvious. And in fact, uh, what is interesting here is that this is in fact being incorporated in the mainstream here right now. Okay, absolutely. Uh, now we could debate to what extent, and I completely, you know, agree that that may not be what may satisfy some of us here, and certainly environmentalists and so on. But indeed, it's something that is there. Uh, with regards to the uh, the gender one, uh, again, it uh, this is an area where I think the the mainstream can swallow to some extent if it's an issue of discrimination and all that kind of stuff, not on the reproductive aspect, you know, I mean, the, the major issues about you know, feminism here per se, but on specific aspects of that, uh, that one could swallow, so to speak, and, and uh, indeed the mainstream uh, policymakers, even if you wish, not like at the Bank of Canada, I think would have something to, you know, to, to say about that. Uh, but where I think they would have a big problem, and uh, uh, which is the one about class <laughs> bias, okay? Yeah. And that's what I would like to ask you. You really believe that the mainstream could possibly you know, uh, get into that aspect. They'll talk about inequality, you know, about the size distribution of income. They will accept certain aspects of that, but they will not accept class, you know, issues here, if you want to call it that. Uh, and uh, so th that's where I think uh, there is a, a real conflict, so to speak. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and it's so, not just you know, about rent to years cap, you know, this whole kind of thing there. That's something which you will not uh, easily yeah. find them addressed. Uh, first of all, um, I want to apologize. I just got a dog on Monday and he's <laughs> he's alone right now. And I named him Maynard, by the way, uh, in, you know, and I forgot to say at the beginning, I should have worn my mask about what would Keynes do. Mario has one as well. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so Mario, I mean, that's sort of the history of, of post-Keynesian economics, is it? Doing a research that the mainstream will never accept. Um, and what can I say? I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, between us, maybe we can talk about class bias. Maybe uh, if I was ever giving this paper in a mainstream audience, I would probably not use certain words, uh, trigger words, and talk about inequality. But you know, the good thing about you know, but, but I'm not, I, I don't completely disagree uh, agree with you in the sense that. There is a lot of research now being done in central banks and by mainstream people where they do recognize income inequality uh, uh, consequences. So it's not that far of a stretch anymore to go from, they admit that, everyone admits that. Now, to go from that to say, ah, maybe it's a class issue may not be, you know, they might resist it, but I think deep down inside, they they have to think, they have to somehow realize that that it does come down to, to class bias. You know, I mean, what is inequality if not class? Um, so, yeah, it's yeah. a question maybe of how we can sell the message, but. Uh, I think there are some. Yeah, I'm not going to answer questions about MMT. Look, uh, if you want to have my opinion, there was a, uh, a symposium last year, was it? In the uh, World Economic Review, is that what it's called? Mario? The online journal, uh, the World Economic Review, in which I have a paper uh, and quite a few. It's, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, symposium, by the way. But I do have, and I've made my position there uh, clear. It's a paper called um, Tina, MMT and Tina. Uh, not the drug, of course, but uh, <laughs> there is no alternative. Okay, I don't, I don't know if, if there are more questions. I don't see raising the hands, and of you would like to participate, the ones that you are here. Okay, well, uh, if there are no questions, thank you, Alicia, for this invitation. I mean, thank you for the Cesar, Cesar Duarte, I haven't seen your hand. Yes, yes, yes. I just saw. Yeah, hi, I just raised my hand. That, that's why you hadn't seen it. Uh, uh, well, th thank Cesar, you. How are you? Fine, fine. Thanks for that. Talk. It was really interesting. I was thinking about the, the gender bias and immediately before you start talking the, the first time you, you, you mentioned it, I immediately, immediately talked about the uh, women participation in, in policy making. I don't know if you have that, that if you we are do. planning to explore that part or, or we just the effect. Yeah. We absolutely do, and in fact, uh, that is part of the uh, of the second year. And in fact, we Guillaume Valet and I have done internal surveys in central banks, uh, Central Bank of England, uh, Central Bank of Hungary, Central Bank we, we do, uh, uh, of Israel. We've done surveys in about four or five central banks about this, about the internal composition, um, and my. My position, I agree. So I think it's an interesting question to explore. My problem with that is, uh, you know, having Margaret Thatcher as governor of the Central Bank of England would not have made it necessarily more gender friendly. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's not because, and I'm, you know, really uh, want to explore the issue of pluralism in the decision-making internally at the central banks, and we're gonna look at that. But I am a little bit more skeptical, right? I think here it's more about ideological biases than it is about gender or race. Uh, I would like to make a comment. Thank you. Um, 
thank you, Cesar. Uh, just to finish, I, I want to make a comment. Yesterday, the um, the program, the university program studies of Asian Africa, had a, colloqu a colloquium with Mese University, who is in New Zealand, and we have different um, sessions: mining, environment, climate change, and one is gender. And the person who was there who made a wonderful talk was Fernanda Vidal. He talked about how gender is in Mexico. And one of the conclusions is that if you are having a lot of women, that doesn't mean that you are going to have a gender agenda. Mm -hmm. And also I make the comment because I have been using a lot the, the Global Gender Gap Report of the Davos Forum, which is wonderful because you have the different gaps in education, in health, in, polit in economy, and also in political uh, uh, participation in, in, in political, especially in the parliament. And I have, I, 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 well, at the end, I told them how is gender because I made a cooperation between the, uh, the gender gaps between Mexico and, ja and Japan. And what you can find in when the, the report, the first report was in 2006, and Japan and Mexico were more or less in the same level. When you see that 2020 uh, gender, uh, glo global gender gap report, is Mexico is now in the 25th. And and Japan is in the 121. So what happened? That in Mexico, since the last uh, election, we have more women in the parliament, but that doesn't mean that they have a feminist or a gender vision. And when you compare the macroeconomic index between Japan and, and, and Mexico, you have to be you 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 must be aware of what is what are, what is going in our country. So gender in politics doesn't mean that we are going to have a gender agenda or a feminist agenda. And I want to I would like to say because most of the people say that with more uh, more women in the parliament you are going to have you are going to be more safely and that's really incorrect. And that is a policy that the government most of the times used to have more votes. But Wesley ha has raised his hand. Wes, I pass the microphone. Yes, I, thank you. Just before you answer, Wesley, one of the pictures, the pictures in the presentation are pictures I've taken when I've been traveling. I have a picture of you in a restaurant that I was going to put, but it was not, it's not very flattering. So I'll send it to you though. <laughs> Well, I, I have one very unflattering picture of me with uh, you and Alicia when we were in uh, Buenos Aires <laughs> and where we saw Alejandro Banoli, who we'll see in a second here. So do you, do you have a question? Yes. Um, kind of a quick comment, perhaps. It'll be quick, but um, just... Um, Listening to uh, the questions of Cesar, Mario, Alicia, and, and you right now, I would um, wonder if you are considering um, what, uh, what Alicia was just saying. I think we can um, just to, because we have such a, a, a diversity of, uh, of thoughts in our group, I think we could maybe um, to, to study the central banks, we could certainly use a bit of a Polanyan angle and identify the historical actors in why central banks exist to begin with. In Tamario's point, which I think would go along much better with our um, sort of recent legacy of um, research into this, is the, the social ontology group. I think they have a very um, interesting, quick view on this as the claimants on a society's surplus and the legitimate claimants financial rent, productive workers, and productive capitalists. And I think if we can go into, um, and to follow what um, uh, you all have been doing so well in recent years, how exactly central banks work and to which class they are serving, going to Mario's things. 
in here, maybe if we would use um, um, claimants on a society's surplus rather than class, it might be a sort of entrance point into that because especially right now with the sort of K recovery, we see how everything's going to financial rent, but nothing's going to production or workers, especially productive workers, because we're sending money to people through the sort of backdoor universal basic income, but not to finance product production itself. So it was sort of just an idea um, uh, building on you and Mario and, and Alicia and Ceso's conversation. And to turn it into a question, what do you think about it? Thank you. Uh, I'm, I hadn't thought about that, to be honest. Um, you know, I wonder is from the mainstream perspective, is there really a big difference in terms of terminology here or concepts? Uh, you know, whether we talk about uh, division of surplus or class or, I mean, these are sort of all trigger words in my opinion. I'm not sure, uh, but you and I can have this conversation for sure, for sure. Thank you very much. Okay, Luis Philippe, thank you very much. And we just a hello to everybody, especially, uh, especially Massimo. Oh, uh, Massimo. Well, nice to see you, Massimo. And Gary, and uh, of course, Mario and Wesley, and everybody else on this thread that I can't. Uh... Oh, Jonathan is here. Thank you. Hello, Jonathan. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And thank hello, you. Hello, Luis Philippe, and thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And there's Gary. Okay. Um, Thank and you I apologize much. for not having been here yesterday, but Wednesdays, I had uh, three hours of meetings, two hours of, um, you know, office hours, virtual, and then six hours of classes. So I couldn't, I could not be here. Yes, that's a problem, Luis Philippe, that now you can say, well, I am, I am traveling. Oh, I am. A... <laughs> you just can say that you have to be at the same time in two or three Zooms. Thank you very much, Ms. Philippe. We are very happy to see you and to honor Eugenia, our friend, our lovely friend. Well, I am going to pass the microphone to Sergio, who is already here, and also to Alejandro Banoli. Bienvenidos, Alejandro. Vamos a hacer un corte en este momento y en segundos pasamos. José Carlos, tú me dices, por favor, para iniciar. Sí. 